Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall was filmed at the headquarters of the Kentucky Historical Society. Join us as we reveal Kentucky family mysteries, share tips from our experts, and learn about Kentucky history, telling Kentucky's story, one family at a time. Thank you for being a part of the Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall. I'm Renee Shaw, and we have somewhat of an unusual reveal right now because three people asked if their ancestors were victims of the infamous Harp Brothers. Many of you have heard about the men called the Harp Brothers. There was Big Harp, Macasia, and Little Harp, Wiley, and they also had other aliases. In the late 1790s, they traveled through a Kentucky with three women, their wives, leaving a trail of death. They posed as ministers or fellow travelers, anything that would allow them to just kind of fit in where they were at the, at the time. And their actions earned them the distinction of being perhaps the first U.S. serial killers. J. Mark Lowe with the Kentucky Tennessee Research Associates is gonna tell us more in this video. The Harps came over the mountains from Virginia to East Tennessee and Eastern Kentucky. They lived quietly amongst people for a short while, but seemed to find within their hearts an inclination to do worse. They committed their first murders over in the East Tennessee Territory. And as folks began to identify who they were, not knowing them as the Harps, they ran to the Cumberland Gap, the great way to Kentucky. As they went into that area, it was not long until they killed people on the Rockcastle River. They moved into the Cumberland County area. They moved into the Green River. They were committing murders as they went, ultimately going as far as Henderson, Kentucky and Cave and Rock, not leaving an area until they had committed murder. But they moved. They didn't stop. They continued moving from one place to another, staying in homes of people who would protect them. Over the period of four to five years, they killed upwards of 50 people, including infants. They had a very peculiar way of killing folks, uh, tended to do it in a wilderness way, cut their throats, killed with tomahawks. They often would slit them open, fill them up with rocks, and sink them into the nearest water course so that they wouldn't be found for days. They traveled almost back and forth from East Tennessee all the way to Henderson, Kentucky and back on at least three occasions, often stopping at friends' houses along the way. It's important for us to know that the Harps were known throughout this area and they also knew the people who lived here. As folks were moving and migrating westward, the Harps were traveling exactly where they went. They could not have done what they did without having, quote, accomplices in this area. Somebody who would welcome them and hide them and not turn them in. So as we look at the stories, it's important for us to realize these things require something larger. In fact, we believe that the person who ultimately killed and beheaded Big Harp was an accomplice for many years. With friends like that, who needs them, right? <laughs> <I know. laughs> but 50 victims, four yeah. to five years, uh, it's hard to imagine. But let's learn about some of those victims. And we have with us Mark, who's from Springfield, Tennessee, which is north of Nashville and in a county that abuts Kentucky. Welcome to Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall. Mm, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for all the work. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, you asked our researchers a question about the Hart Brothers that centers on your ancestor, Mary Lankford Todd. Tell us what you asked the researchers to determine. Well, it, it's actually been discussed in the family for over 200 years, and it just keeps going back and forth, and you seem to be able to pick a thread from each direction and you get conflicting information. Mm -hmm. But um, Mary Lankford is supposedly had a brother that was the first victim of the harps inside the state of Kentucky. And so it's just been debated back and forth. Is this person really the brother of Mary Lankford Todd, which is my uh, direct uh, grandmother? Mm -hmm. And is the name correct? Is the name, he, he died as a young man, so uh, there's just a lot of questions. A lot of questions, and we hope we can provide some answers. If you will, let's look at the first document, if you'll flip that over for us. 
The murder you asked us about took place in this area, and the story goes like this, and folks can see it on the screen as well. Lankford came from Virginia, and we think he was going to buy land in Kentucky. In December 1798, he stopped one morning at a public house near Rock Castle River to eat breakfast. Uh, the harps came in while he was there, and they looked kind of bedraggled and impoverished, and must have been a sight because all three women Macasia and Wiley's legal wives, and Macasia had a supplementary wife. <laughs> you can determine that what that means for yourself. But all three women were pregnant. Oh. Wow, right? Uh, the publican asked them if they wanted to eat, and, but they declined because they didn't have any money to pay. Lankford's kindness may have cost him his life here. Yes. Uh, he overheard the harps and bought them all breakfast. Uh, when he paid the publican, the harps noticed that he had a large amount of money on him. And Langford and the harps, they left the public house together. A few days later, cattle drovers found Langford's mutilated body in the woods. And we heard in the video mm. what their preferred method was. So what was the victim's first name? And was it your ancestor's brother? Yes. Well, there are some confusing discrepancies in published sources, but we do have some information for you. So let me walk you through our research and explain our final thoughts to you. First, to determine the correct given name of the victim, we knew we had to find sources that originated as close to the time of the murder as possible. The Harps killed Mr. Langford in December of 1798. We found several contemporary newspaper accounts of the murder that gave the victim's full name, hometown and sometimes other details. Great. So look at the next document for us, if you will, and read that transcription out loud. It says, uh, Richmond, January 22nd, on the 12th day of December last, on his way to Kentucky in the wilderness, Mr. Thomas Langford of Pennsylvania County was in inhumanely massacred by five persons, two men and three women. We understand these abandoned wretches have been apprehended and the money, about 50 pounds, uh, horses or horse and clothing taken from the unfortunate victim. Recovered Mr. Langford was a man of much uh, respectability and his loss is sincerely lamented by all who had the pleasure of his acquaintance but to his father and his relatives, his death is a source of the deepest affection. Uh, affliction, yes. Affliction. This is a reprint of a newspaper article from <sighs> Richmond, really? Virginia, that ran in the Georgia Gazette in February 1799. <sighs> That's crazy. Uh, isn't that something? It seems clear that the victim's given name <sighs> was Thomas. Thomas. And he was from Pennsylvania County, Virginia. But to make sure, we always want multiple sources, so we kept looking. We found a record from the Lincoln County Court created after the Hart brothers' arrest for Mr. Lankford's murder. It outlines the charges against them. It was extremely helpful and unambiguous. So please look at the next document for us. Okay, as you can see from its multiple references, there is no question that Thomas Lankford was the victim. No question. Now, was he your ancestor's brother? This is a little bit more difficult to prove, okay. <laughs> okay? So try to sort it out. We went to tax lists and other primary sources as well as published secondary sources. First, and this is very good news, we found only one Thomas Lankford in the Pennsylvania County records that made the search easier. Next, we found that Benjamin and Thomas Lankford appeared next to each other on Pennsylvania County tax lists for nearly a decade, beginning in 1789 and ending in January 1798, the year the victim Thomas traveled in Kentucky. Now, will you please look at the next document for us? Their proximity on the list indicates a close relationship between the two men, and we found another indication. In 1767, Benjamin became the first sheriff of, P of Pennsylvania County. Twenty years later, in 1787, Thomas Langford was appointed to the small group of men that served as Pennsylvania County deputy sheriffs. It's almost as Thomas was following in Benjamin's footsteps. It would have been ideal to have been able to look at census records to see a list of Benjamin's children, but as you know, the census at this time only listed the head of the household by name. That meant we had to look elsewhere. We found a list of Benjamin's children in his will, but it was a bit inconclusive. So will you look at the next document, please? 
So Benjamin died in 1810, more than a decade after Thomas did. Right. His will names these children, Benjamin, Stephen, Mary Todd, who was your ancestor, right. Anne Madison, Sarah Brown, Kitty Turner, and Henrietta. Your ancestor definitely was Benjamin's daughter. All of the previous evidence indicates that Benjamin and Thomas had a close relationship, and we think there is a strong possibility that their relationship was father and son, which means that Thomas likely was your ancestor's brother. Ah, oh, fantastic. Bingo, right? It's great. Isn't that something? Yeah. What do you think about all of this? Well, it's, it's great to have all the pieces. It's the names have switched back and forth in the records. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he died without being married, there was no marriage records to rely on. It, it's wonderful to be able to connect it. And he died before his father, so he wasn't in the will, right. so yes. And so now you can clear up all the family discrepancies at yeah. dinner next time. So great. thank you very much for giving us this charge to look into your family history, and we hope that you really reveled in it just as much as I, we have. I have, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And the story continues in Act Two. We have with us Judy Hudgens. Uh, you're coming to us from Clarksville, Tennessee today. Yes. Thank you for making the drive in. Well, we just heard the story of Thomas Langford, one of the Harps' first Kentucky victims. Uh, the Harps actually were arrested, tried, and convicted of Langford's murder. They were in jail in Danville, but unfortunately for other families, they escaped, they escaped because they're just that, that kind. That's how they roll. Your question centers on a heart murder that took place about 10 months after they killed Thomas Langford, and it happened on the opposite side of the state. The details and the victims' names came to light after Big Harp was killed. Little Harp had run away, and the Harp wives faced trial. In court, the women told about the murder of two men, Hudgens and Gilmore, yes. who had been to Robinson's Lick. They were returning to their homes and had set up camp for the night. So would you please look at the first document for us, please? Now, Robinson's Lick is here, and you're seeing that on your document as well as on the screen sure in Western Kentucky. The men's misfortune was in choosing a campsite near where the Hart brothers had just robbed a family, yes. murdered three people, and burned the victim's house. Yes. Uh, we found the story in a 19th century history of Kentucky. So would you please read the excerpt on the next document, please? Two men named Hudgens and Gilmore were returning from the lick with their packs of salt and had camped for the night. About daylight, the harps went to their camp and arrested them upon pretense that they had committed robbery, murder, and arson. They shot Gilmore, who died on the spot. Hudgens broke and ran, but was overtaken by the Harps and put to death. These things were stated by the women after Big Harp's death. So your question is whether this Hudgens is yes. your ancestor. I never could find his first name, so I wasn't sure. You've handed us an extremely challenging puzzle, but we like challenging okay. puzzles. Okay. In fact, it is one with a lot of missing pieces, so I'm afraid I don't have some good news for you. Okay. Like you, we were unable to determine who Hudgens and Gilmore were because we don't have their given names. Right. Uh, an obvious source to find them would be the documents from the women's trial. Unfortunately, those are missing from the Logan County Court records. Bad luck. We turned to other sources to look for local men with the surnames Hudgens and Gilmore. It would have been ideal to have found only one man with the Hudgens surname in the area, but we found several, as you can see from the next document. So look okay. how many people have similar name as the Hudgens. Yes. Yes. So there is no way with the information we have to narrow that list. And spelt all different ways. And spelt all different ways, right? Also, if you consider that the salt lick probably would have drawn people from outside the local mm -hmm. area, the pool potentially grows even larger. Right. So bottom line, without given names, it's just impossible to identify sure. these harp victims. And I know this is very disappointing news. No. Uh, we're very sorry that we weren't able to no, help you. But we hope we can hope that those court records do turn up one day. That can be our best hope. So tell us how you feel about what, what you've learned. I, well, I knew journey. it was a long shot. Um, I, we knew that a branch of our Hudgens that had come to Tennessee, a, a branch had gone to Kentucky. 
but none of the dates were lining up. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if it was one of them or just a stray. But it helps clear up a little bit, yeah. Right. Well, many times when we research for our ancestors, we find multiple people with the same name. Right. So similar to the experience you've had. So how do we know which is the right one? Well, Sherry Daniels, who's a researcher here, tells us how in this video. Okay. One of the most frustrating aspects of researching your ancestry can be found in the naming traditions of our ancestors. For many generations, a family would honor past ancestors by naming the children after beloved progenitors of the past. When this happens and you're faced with several individuals in a community with the same name, how do you make sure you're on the right track? Here are a few guidelines to follow. One, step back and take a broader look at the person's life. The identity of each individual is comprised of many factual puzzle pieces that fit together just right. For instance, beyond birth and death, a person had an occupation, a residence, and other family members. One important way to help identify the correct individual is by looking at their family members, both past and present. Sometimes the family unit in name and age listed over a few decades in the census can help confirm or rule out an ancestral candidate. Two, do the math. Are the years of activity over time making sense according to the age the person should be at the time in question? If you're searching for your Civil War ancestor, don't claim a person who had the right name but was only 10 years old in 1865. Three, map it out. Study the location of residence for a potential ancestor and then apply this to known or suspected family migration routes. And remember, just because your ancestor moves to another county doesn't rule out their potential. Sometimes the county boundaries moved around them instead of the other way around. So in conclusion, just remember this final rule. No one piece of documentation will confirm the identity of an ancestor. Multiple pieces of information have to align just correctly in order to affix this person to your tree. So I'm sure, Judy, those are all things that you've taken to heart and yes. understand completely. There have been many records I wished for a, a Leroy or Billy Bob besides John, James, <laughs> or William. <laughs> well, thank you, Judy, so very much thank for, you for helping for us all on, of that. Yes, on all of this and uh, do a little digging. It's been a lot of fun. Thank, thank you. you. So we have one more piece of the puzzle left in this saga of family history. We have with us Lee from Louisville. Thank you for being with us on this Kentucky Ancestors Town Hello. Hall. Hello. Yes, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, we all have family stories. They can be interesting and even in entertaining, but how do we know if they're true? And one of your family stories is that an ancestor was a harp victim, but you aren't sure which ancestor that was or where it fit into your family tree, right? That's the story. That's the story, and you're sticking to that. <laughs> um, there's, there was definitely a harp victim. Understand love is, mm -hmm. is the name, surname here. Love. Right. Uh, would you please look at the first mm -hmm. document, please, for us? Map of Kentucky. Map of Kentucky. So Hudgens and Gilmore were not the only harp victims to die near Robinson's Lick in August of 1799. Remember that the harps had just murdered three people before they killed Hudgens and Gilmore. A newspaper article from December 31st, 1799, identifies the victims of that triple murder. They were Mary Stiegel, mm -hmm her four-month-old son, and a traveler named William Love, mm -hmm. who stayed overnight in the Stiegel home. Mm -hmm. Besides the newspaper article, we also have a more detailed account. And will you look at the next mm -hmm. document for us and read it out loud? Mm. It says, the next year after my father had settled his family on his land on Little Caney Creek, he was killed by the Harps while he was on a tour of surveying in what is now Hopkins County near the Henderson County line. My father had stopped for the night when about dark the Harps came to put up in the same house, the Steagles, and plundering the house, set fire to it and burnt it all up. William Love's son wrote this account. Even further proof of William's death is the gravestone of his wife, Esther. So hmm. I'd like you to look at the hmm. next document there and read out loud the transcription there. 
My name was Esther Love, born September 30th, 1765, died March 2nd, 1844. My husband, William Love, was killed by the harps. Isn't that something to have mm. it on your tombstone? Mm. No, Definitely I can't imagine. I there, cannot imagine. You? Well, this is a tragic story, like all the harp mm. murders. William and his wife moved to Kentucky not long before the harps killed him. The Loves had married in 1785 and settled in Pendleton District, South Carolina, where their first five children were born. Ooh. The son, who wrote of William's death, was born in Knox County, Tennessee in 1798, while William prepared the family's Kentucky home. Okay. Lee, mm. William Love was your fifth great-grandfather. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we well, followed the family line down through William's daughter, Jane Noble Love, through her son, Robertus Love Moore. And will you please look at the next okay. document, okay? And this okay. is where it all comes together for you. Okay. All right, so here you see William and Jane, Robertus Love Moore, Sarah, and on down and there. to Lee. And there we are. And there you are. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe how, the emotions of this discovery? No, I just can't imagine to lose your uh, uh, husband and father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's more, Lee. Mm. One more thing we'd like to tell you. But first, I want to ask Judy to join us. So we have Judy back on the stage with us. Judy, we weren't successful in finding a harp victim connection through your father's line. Right. But what we didn't tell everyone is that you know you descend from a harp victim through your mother's line. Yes. Will you tell Lee who that ancestor was? William Love was my sixth great grandfather. Is that through right? Through his son Robardus. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we're cousins. <laughs> I had a feeling we were cousins. <laughs> yes. That's incredible. Isn't that something? Uh, you probably just in your communication today may have felt a little cousin kindred. We were, we were trying to figure it all out, but there was yes. something there, yes. There was a little something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how shocking is it to see your, your fellow kinfolk it's today? It's a small world. It, it, it really <laughs> is. It really is. <laughs> And, and through a somewhat tragic story, right. a family is brought together. So I think that's a pretty yeah. good ending right. by my yeah. account. Well, any uh, final thoughts you all would like to share with us about this discovery? It's, it's, it's been wonderful, and thank you so much for it. I feel We're lucky just, to have yeah. found this out. Yeah, well, so glad that the pieces of the puzzle could be put together for yeah. both of you. Awesome. Thank you yeah. for being thank a part you. of the Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall. And we know that you all will be having coffee and lunch and all kinds oh, of we're good things. We're going to change email and everything. We know we have a love connection. <laughs> That's exactly. Really love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh, That's fantastic.